We go through so many trials and tribulations, so much suffering by definition as people. In the end, you have to ask yourself, what does make it all worthwhile? My name is Dr. Chris Dula, and here is my story. I cannot go anywhere in Johnson City without someone saying, are you his wife? And of course, you know, I always say, yeah, I'm his wife. And oh, we love Dr. Dula. He is amazing. He is the best professor that we've ever had. Whether it's um, going to a restaurant or a store, handing them my debit card, they see the name, and, Im and immediately they go into a story about either him being their teacher or a story about how he's touched them or how he's made a difference in their life. So he's, he's kind of the rock star in Johnson City. Everybody loves him. We don't like rules, so we're going to have three. Number one is we never take money to play. Number two is we never practice. Well, number three is we must have fun. Y'all have fun? Y'all have fun? That's the goal. Just I've been playing music since I was 13 years old, but I'm just not that good at it. Uh, but I love it. I just love playing. And so I went down to the local coffee house and just kind of started jamming. And then I started jamming with this awesome professor, bass player, Steve Marshall. And what we discovered was we just had a great time, but then we started into this kind of charity mission where we would just play for free because we all had good day jobs. The people said, don't quit your day job. And it's like, why would I? I love my day job. I have a great hobby at night, which is playing music. So anyway, the music thing became kind of a charity mission, more or less, and uh, had a great time doing good work. I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. Pretty much everything occurred there. I thought I was born, bred, and probably be dead in Charlotte. Growing up as a child, there were no hardships. I was well taken care of, no abuse, no neglect, and material comfort. I didn't really appreciate the fact that I had these advantages. As I grew up and went into school, I became a very anti-authority personality type. I became an alcoholic at 13 years old. That was inadvertent. It was, uh, that first drink was given to me uh, by an older family member who just thought nothing of giving a 13-year-old a mixed drink. And, and I became instantly, instantly addicted. It just got worse and worse and worse. And I got into the heavy metal scene, which was all about just railing against, you know, the status quo. And that seemed to resonate with me. And to the point that I, you know, would have been unemployable in any other field except construction. I looked like a drunk ragamuffin because I was in fact a drunk ragamuffin. And I started construction as kind of the only way that I knew I was going to get a regular paycheck. And I just, I didn't have a passion for it. And so ultimately I kind of, I was, I got married to my first wife who I don't know what she saw in me, but she was a sweet and wonderful human being. I, I was 20, she was 19. So I was young, dumb, and a drunk and obnoxious. And, and ultimately I feared for her safety and told her, you gotta go, you gotta go. And that was scary to me. And that's when I became committed to becoming nonviolent. But at the same time, I hadn't quite got there yet. Uh, I got married. The second time to the woman who had a 10 year old daughter and that's a fairly complex story and really a beautiful story she moved in we got married i had this stepdaughter there was some paternal in me that i didn't know existed i never planned to have kids you know it just it never occurred to me but there was something about this child where she needed stability she needed somebody who cared deeply about her to provide guidance to her and um, I got into a conflict with her mom. She's like, I'm leaving, I'm taking my daughter. And I lost the first marriage over my alcoholism. I was about to not only lose a second marriage, but this child who I knew needed me. And that I said, don't leave. I, I will quit drinking, I will never drink again. And that's exactly what I did. That moment was my moment of truth. It's like, I quit drinking. I have never had a drink since, and that was over 25 years ago. And then my second wife also then wasn't supposed to be able to get pregnant according to medical professionals, and yet she did. And so I wound up with my biological son and I got my two children. And for all the stuff I've gone through in this world, I would say nothing is more fulfilling than having raised those two children. 
I never wanted to go to college. I hated high school and I didn't know that college was any different. My dad had been, my mom had been, but they never really conveyed to me like how different it was or why it would matter. I mean, all I knew is I needed to pay my bills and construction did it, but I hated it. I was faced with a real dilemma. What am I gonna do? So I started in the summer of 1992 thinking, if I hate this, I'll just quit. I'll, I, yeah, I'll suck it up and go hang sheet rock because I can always do that. But one of the first classes I took was in philosophy. I was blown away. I've always been a learner. I just hated high school because I didn't like people telling me what to do. But guess what they don't do in college? And so I loved it. I, I ate it up. I then got this focus that I'd never had before. And, and started like, I was already making A's, but it's like, okay, I gotta go to the next level. I can't just get an associate's degree. I gotta go get a bachelor's degree. And then I got you know, schooled and that process is like, you should probably go get a master's degree. And then during that process, it's like, you should probably go get a doctoral degree if you can. And it's like, it turns out when I quit drinking and I focused my energy on raising this child and then my infant son, and I was then in grad school and working on the side, it's like, that was, that was the moment where I now cared. It gave me purpose in life. And that's to be a better role model to my daughter, to be able to think down the road, I'm gonna have a career that's gonna take care of my kids better. Like that became a purpose for me. And then later I found out I could turn it around and give back to students and patients what I got from the process of learning all that information. I got my doctorate and there was a postdoctoral fellowship at University of Memphis. It was a two-year job. So I could have been, stayed there for two years and, and been okay. But then the job at ETSU opened up and that was where my second wife was from and she'd always said, you know, I wish I could go back home. Anyway, I, I always liked this place because I've been visiting it for years and I got the job. I started here in 04 at ETSU in Johnson City and found my purpose in life. Now the dissolution of that marriage happened here. Uh, and it was pretty tragic, but at the same time it needed to happen and it did happen and so parted ways. But anyway, when, when the marriage dissolved, I was Facebooking. Cause I, why did I get on the social media stuff? It's cause all these students, my job is to teach people who are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old and they were all on Facebook. So I was there and I saw this beautiful woman and I saw that she had a lot of interests that were really very much overlapping with mine and I just took a risk. I was divorced for several years and after having really, really bad um, dating issues, I had actually decided not to see anyone else and then one day I received a message on Facebook. We did call one another and we spent our first conversation eight hours straight on the phone. It was an instant connection. We went to a restaurant in Kingsport called Giuseppe's, which was really close to where I lived at the time in Kingsport. That was it. We have been inseparable ever since. And we have never been apart since then. And we've been married six years now. And it's just amazing to me that I could have found such a woman that I actually feel like I deserve such a woman. That I've, I've made so many good corrections in my life. Like if I was who I was 25 years ago, I would not deserve this person. But at this point, I feel like not only did I deserve it, but it was supposed to be this way. But, you know, people always kind of, well, some older people always talk about, no, the virtual world, these kids today, they are on their phones, they're all on, you know, they don't live in the real world. And I'm like, well, if it wasn't for the virtual world, I wouldn't be really married right now. I, I, I'm married in reality. And that happened with an assist from the virtual world because I was able, as she lived in Kingsport, I would never have met Denise had it not been for social media. And having met her on social media, I am now in the not only the healthiest and best relationship of my life, I feel like I am home. I have, I have found my the compliment of my soul. Come to now is the fact that I do have a brain tumor. Um, and that was discovered um, in a fairly dramatic fashion but i was with my five-year-old niece who i call lala and she's like a surrogate grandbaby to me and she's just the sweetest and smartest kid you can ever imagine we always go to this museum called hands-on regional well i was standing with her doing what we would always do just hanging out i lost acuity in my lower left visual field meaning that when i looked at her she just became like this blob-like shape i lost all detail and having all my other mental processes working fine what occurred to me is I might be having a stroke in my occipital lobe. Like the area involved in vision 
right now I could be experiencing a stroke. And if that's the case, they are not kidding when they say every second matters. I said, Lala, can you help me get to Denise's office? She's like, yes. Like, I knew that you could, baby. So we go to the only intersection. We stop as we always stop. She looks left. She looks right. She looks left again. She's like, we can cross. I'm like, let's hold hands and go through the zebra. She's like, okay. So we cross the crosswalk. And so, yeah, she, she, she kind of led me. That's why I call her my little hero. Like, she just was so calm, cool, and collected. All of a sudden, he comes through my door in my office downtown, which is a couple of blocks away from hands-on, and he said, something's wrong. I got into Denise's office, and I'm like, baby, I don't want to scare you. I have to get to medical attention now. They ordered the MRI, and, and within a short period of time, of course, we found out he did have a brain tumor. And then they did a biopsy on that tumor, which is obviously what you got to do. But you don't get to any kind of area of the brain where you're taking out small pieces that you don't also take out very important pieces. That was a pretty traumatic surgery. I was in the hospital for a week at least, and that was the point at which I also had some ser real serious uh, problems with sleep. I couldn't remember most of this episode. Uh, Denise has written a journal down so when I can finally kind of think straight, I can go back and see what really happened. Anyway, ever since then I've been home, I've been working every day. What we know about neuroplasticity is when you lose neurons, they're, they're gone. But there's other ones around that that are in good shape and healthy and if you work them, they'll grow. He has used this whole experience to uplift other people to try to express that there's always hope and he has a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope. We have a lot of faith. God has gotten me through this because without him I just can't imagine going through this. I just want to tell people that I don't want to be too overly positive because in the sense that I am positive for sure I've been working on my own improvement of my own core self for a long time but i also have some some remarkably good things going in my favor that not everybody gets and that's unfortunate that people don't always have access to good health care and i do people do not always have a, a good prognosis and i do there's a good chance for a cure here and i'm going to do everything i can do but whatever i can't do i'm gonna let go and let god i'm a man of deep and abiding faith uh, but for me i know that no matter what happens i'm going to be okay and I'm not only going to be okay in the hereafter, one way or the other, I'm also going to be okay here now. He has such a positive outlook, and of course I try to as well, but it's scary. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the future holds. Optimism matters. I mean, there's scientific literature that shows that, and I don't expect people to just find a silver lining in some horrible news. Uh, this is bad. Having brain cancer is a bad thing. But if there's a greater plan in it, why not make something good come out of it? It's very humbling to see um, how people have reached out to us, to me personally, to him. And I don't think there's another person in this world that deserves the love and support he's been given because he has given it so much all during his life. It, it just makes my heart happy to know that that people are there for us and, and for him. Yeah. I was the recipient of dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, and I'm, I mean seriously, well-meaning, loving messages on Facebook, email, people just going, what happened? What's going on? How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything we can do? And I, I, I couldn't even read them because I couldn't focus much less respond to them all and I thought I want to touch base with all these people who care about me maybe I could just do a video and my best friend he's like this would be a good story for Ellen I'm like I, I guess it would I have the book you know the book was always a charity mission right it's like if if, if we could go to Ellen's show we'll sell more books I'll give more money away because that was part of what I was doing anyway so I just did the live video to basically tell people okay I have a tumor we you know, went to the hospital I'm okay I'm gonna be okay and here's this thing and at this point that video the original one has been viewed over 71,000 times we, we hope that good comes out of it no matter what happens there are people who don't have family um, they they don't have the resources to get the help they need and and we hope that this 
you know, will bring awareness to that so that people have a little bit more empathy for others going through what he's going through right now. So back to the question, which is a great question. I mean, what makes life worth it? And for me, it comes down to one word, love. It's what you love. My love for my family drove me to become a better person and then to get the skills and abilities that gave me a job that I love, which gave me students that I love to help. It gave me patients I love to help. It gave me a sense of purpose, a mission in life. So I get to do things that I love, but it's that love that drives me on a daily basis and is sustaining me as I go through this battle of cancer. Is like, you know what? I'm gonna get to keep teaching. I'm gonna get to keep helping people. And I love doing that. And so the love that I feel for, again, my, my wife and my kids is core to who I am. But then also the broader family, the friendships, the community, the things that I get to do now, I have cultivated in myself and it's been driven by love.